So we've heard from Steve about some of the issues involved in protein folding, but the, what we're going to talk about is actually a lot more general because you have this huge pathway of one enzyme after one enzyme after another after another. How do you get them in the right order? How do you move things along? How does this thing move along a, a chain? Like, how do you get the right enzyme acting at the right place and at the right time? And so, there's a whole question of which, of sort of molecular management, of which pr protein folding is a, is a simple example that we focused on to start with because it's been a, an issue for the last 50 years, 55 years, that the pe getting proteins to fold um, is, is not easy. So what I'm doing now is to give, some, give a proposal for how this might work. And Steve's give little sneak previews of what I'm going to say in his talk. And so what I'm going to do is allow, have a proposal mechanism by which spiritual influx has an effect in, in, in the physical, in nature. Um, or if I wasn't a Swedenborgian group, I would say in the natural that has a different meaning for some of you. But I'm talking about in nature or in physics. So this is breaking the shell of physical closure. So the, this talk at the end has, has four parts to it. First of all, I'm going to, going to give an overview of what I'm trying to do, what method I will be using. And then I'm going to suggest what influx actually does in physics. And if you read Steve's talk, you'll see that what my proposal consists of. And then I'm going to, number three, I'm going to spend a little bit more time discussing how, how it works, how it's organized, what does influx actually do to, to, organize, to make these changes in physics. And then I'm going to make a specific proposal, and then I'm going to do some numerical demonstrations which produce movies of a, of a simple toy protein. I'm going to have an, invent a, a protein, a very simple protein with 100, 100 amino acids, with positive and negative charges. It's not going to have um, hydrogen bonds. It's very, very simple. It's a toy protein, but I'm going to show what, what this mechanism might do and how it might be useful. So, as I said, the first one is the overview, and this is a recapitulation of what we had this morning. Remember, these are the bits of physics we don't understand. I'm not going to discuss gravity anymore but I'm going to link together the fine-tuning issue um, in, in quantum field theory, this, uh, the fact that charges have to be adjusted to get the result right, and I'm going to link that with the issue of linking the spiritual with the physical. So I'm going to take these two things that are unknown and sort of make one bigger problem out of it. <laughs> and then we hope that with, with, the in, with the input from the writings, we can have some idea what the what the process could look like. In fact, I'm going to use a lot of, of ideas from the writings as we go forward. And so I'm going to link fine-tuning of, of charges and masses, but I'm going to focus on charges, with influx. So I'm going to propose this, this innermost, I call it the 3.1 degree, that if a physicist knows that there must be something there, there must be something that produces the standard model, but they're not sure what it is. So I'm going to link that. I'm going to say this is where ends come into physics. So th there must be some, this 3.1 degree has the role of love. Something corresponds to love, but it's in the physics. And so it, 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 I say ends up there. Th this is where ends are that determine the means. Because we know that ends never produce effects themselves. Ends generate the means, and then the means operate to produce the effects. That's the whole point of discrete degrees that sort of delegates everything further down. And so I want to propose that the up here that the end determines the means and then the means influence the physical field. So 3.1 is something we don't know. It's going to be like the formative substance that Rubin talked about or the formative forces that Andy talked about, quoting from the writing. So this is this is going to be fine tuning. It's going to be specific tuning because, as I said, in quantum physics, quantum field theory, when they do calculations, they have to adjust their parameters to get the charge of the electron to come out right. And they, once they did that, it was right over the entire universe. But now I'm going to say that there's an adjustment, not just globally, 
But every place, every, every molecule in, the, in a cell has its own fine-tuning. There's local, not global, physics, okay? So the fine-tuning mechanism that of renormalization, which every physicist accepts, although they don't fully understand, I'm going to say that this is now specific. It's not just one renormalization, but it's, it's now specific and adapted to the local circumstances. So this is, this is the new thing. So I suggest that this renormalization, this local renormalization, is specific to li living organisms, that it occurs on all scales of psychology and biology every day and every second of our lives. So that's like something that happens all the time, but we don't recognize it. And I'm just going to focus on the, on the biolog biology aspect. I'm not going to focus on birds. I'm going to focus on the simplest aspect of a particular molecule in a cell li uh, along the lines that uh, Steve showed us. And so I want to propose a mechanism. What is the mechanism? How could we detect it happening? And how could we test the idea? So the basic idea is that we vary the fine-tuned parameters. That the parameters that were renormalized in quantum field theory, those 12 parameters, I'm going to say that these can be adapted by spiritual influx to the local circumstances in order to achieve specific ends or purposes or goals or targets or uses, whatever we call them. For specific uses in a cell, we can adapt the, 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 these renormalization parameters for that purpose. And I'm going to focus on charge because this is the electric charge is the most important thing that governs all this hydrophilic, ionic bonds, hydrophobic, that's all to do with electric charges. The inside of a chaperone molecule is a, like a cage, and it has big negative charges around the inside after, after the molecules come in. And so we, we, the defined structure constant, alpha, is E squared over H cross times C. So th this is just 1 over 137. This is a well-known number in physics, one of the numbers. And physicists have, many physicists have considered varying alpha very, very slowly over the age of the universe since the Big Bang, you know. And so, so th they all agree that variations are conceivable. So now that they agree that it's possible, I'm going to say, well, let's consider over microseconds instead of billions of years. I mean, what's, what's the difference? It's the same physics, but you have to, it's not just random fluctuations, but it's, and it's within living organisms for particular uses. So this is the new idea the proposal. We'll, say, we'll see later on what effect it has on physical laws. I'm saying that you, we, from the purposes of influx, which occurs in living organisms, we would expect it to occur there. It may occur in other places, but, and you may be, we may detect it there. It may be outside living organisms as well, but once we work out how to detect it, maybe we'll find it there as well. Maybe there's a huge zone around us that's changed by this process, but at least it occurs in cells. I'd say it may be the atmosphere. You know, there's lots of speculation for that, auras or whatever. So, so I, but I, now I have a, I have a, a digression. Is, um, Metric time and process time. Some of you will know that I've been persuading some new church people to take th this difference between metric time and process time because Swedenborg is emphatic that there are two kinds of time. There's natural time, clock time, divine number of wisdom. Space and nature is measurable and so is time. You measure by days, weeks, months, seconds, years, centuries, or microseconds or picoseconds. The point is there's a time that's measurable that goes repetitively and, and, and then there's a spiritual time of changes of state or successive actions of love. In the spiritual world, it is different. The progressions of life appear to be in, in time, but appear to be in metric time, but uh, in place of these is something that to do with states of life and successive states. So whenever a love or a propensity operates, that's what I call, I'm going to call that process time, a change of state. When you go from one state to another, that's a step in process time. And, and that applies to quantum states 
as well as the spiritual state. So by calling it process time, I've got a word that can be used both for quantum physics, very useful there, and for, um, for spiritual beings. And as well as that, there's metric time, which is only in physics. It's in the, in the natural world. Four-dimensional space-time is metric. I mean, it has a, you can measure it with great precision. But process time is just one thing after another. You can sort of count the steps, but different people in the, in the different parts of the spiritual world count at different rates. You can, between any steps, of, of process time in, in the spiritual world. Someone else can have lots of steps. You know, like angels, they have lots of intermediate thoughts between each one of our thoughts. Have you read about that? That, you know, there's, there's a lot of complexity in process time because the, it's not a fixed order. There's no minimum time to, for a thought. You can always have a thought if, if you want one, if you need it. So I, I mentioned this. This is a little bit of a digression. Um, I was hoping that someone else today would talk about it, but they didn't. <laughs> But uh, no, this is just a point that process time is the states we have. And so I'm, and I'm getting, and metric time is like a, a, a stretch before us. It's, it's like a space, even, you know, space time is, is the domain you can imagine stretched out in front of you. So instead of everything in this block universe, you have a sort of incremental universe. So I'm going to now t go through some some new church ideas, some ideas from the heavenly doctrines about how love and wisdom operates. Because we're now going to make a claim about some 3.1 and 3.2, these two first degrees, and these correspond to love and wisdom. So we have to refresh our memory about how love and wisdom act together. Because So you should all know these things, and everyone should know them, but I think from the new church point of view, we have a particular uh, understanding that The first step is input from ends to define a goal or a use. So we'd, what we're trying to do is to achieve, a, love wants to achieve a particular use. And, uh, and the love at a certain degree receives from above, so to speak, the idea that a use is something to be done. So once you, so you receive a, an idea of a use that needs to be accomplished. And so therefore, how does wisdom go about achieving a particular use? So I, I've gone through these three steps. First of all, you have to see from now up to the time when you want to achieve the use, you have to see whether it's going to happen or not. And you have, then you have to see whether, if it's not going to happen, how much the discrepancy is. And then you have to work back to what you want to change. So, and then you have to work out, you have to do those changes and carry on until you can work out how to achieve something. So a simple example is picking up a cup of coffee, as you may have done at lunch. You, you, if you have a desire to pick up a cup, you and you want to you want to move your hand over and pick it up, but suppose you're walking along at the same time, you've got to work out where your hand's going to be when you get close to the cup. So you have to look forward in time to see whether you're on course to pick the cup up, and then you have to compare where you, your present plan is with where, where the cup is and work out whether you need to m stretch out a bit more to pick it up or go slower or to pick it up. You have to, you have to see ahead and work out whether the, 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 the goal or the use is going to be accomplished or not. And if you see a mismatch, you have to work backwards so that your hand then goes to the right place at the right time. And then, and if it's not, then you have to move your arm in order to, so you can pick it up at the, in the right way. So the, the, these, so what I'm doing is I'm breaking down into components the, the the stages of how love interplays with wisdom. We often hear of there's love courts wisdom and wisdom courts love. There's an interplay or a play between them. So there's, back, there's a backwards and forwards operation and, which is part of the delight of thinking how to do things. I mean, you're planning a house. You think of all the things you want to do. Your wife says, I'd like this, you know, and then, then you think about how to do it and whether it can be done and, and, and you have to adjust things. And so... I want to use this pattern, A to F, A to E, sorry. Uh, well, that's why I said A to F. Anyway, A to E, and then use this and see what we can do in physics. So 
But before we work out how it works in physics, I want to spell out again what I'm proposing is, is different in physics. And so this is, a rep this is a remember slide on it. This is what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that electric charges, or the effect of electric charges at least, can be changed locally for specific uses in an organism. So this, this is a bit mind-boggling to physicists, but they've already considered that it changes over a million years. Why can't they imagine it changing over a millionth of a second? And just a reminder, Steve showed this formula or something similar. You remember, oh, the top is disappearing. Opposite charges attract and like charges repel. And so there's a formula for the force between particles one and two. There's Q1, Q2, it's a product. So if they're the same, the product's positive and the force is repulsive. It depends on the one over the square of the distance between the positions. And there's a little constant out the front, epsilon. It's called the, the permittivity, or more easily said, the, elect the dielectric constant. Um, so I'm, I'm allowing charges to vary. So varying Q1 will change the force between that charge and all the things that it interacts with. But I'm going to say that it's, it's very similar. Varying Q1 is very similar to varying epsilon 1 or epsilon 2, the permittivity, the dielectric constant at the places. And so there's a formula which you can keep the charges constant and vary the permittivity, or you can keep the permittivity constant and vary the charges. So the same physics is there each way. But I'm going to choose one because I want to minimize the changes to, to the laws of physics, OK? I want to keep Maxwell's equation because that tells you, because I'm going to say it's helpful to vary just the permittivity of the epsilon. Because charge, the conservation of Q is built into the Maxwell's equation. So if I, if I choose the, the varying epsilon option, that means I can keep Maxwell's equations unchanged. And in fact, there's a huge amount of work in engineering with in dielectric materials, which are in capacitors. Of, and the, they know how to vary the dielectric and, um, and, and work out how, how, how to do elect electromagnetism. So. Steve mentioned that, well, maybe he didn't, but in cells, water is a polarized uh, medium, and so cells, water has a dielectric constant of its own, but that's because, but here I'm talking about something more fundamental. This is the dielectric of the vacuum before you put the water in. So th this is more going at the basic level. And so it makes sense because you, we have the physics degree of objects and the physics degree of the field, and then we have something else. And what we're doing is we're just varying the property of the vacuum before we put the field. So th that, this is the frame, this is the basis from which, in, within which um, physics works. So I'm changing, I'm tilting the playing field on which physics rests, okay? Um, the physics has the co these constants in it, these, um, these charge constants or dielectric constants. In the, in the Lagrangian, which determines everything. And these are, these are so-called constants. But now I'm, not, I'm saying they're not constants, but they're variable, the same properties. So instead of having a level playing field of constant constants, I now have a, have a tilted playing field or little bumps everywhere in cells. It, it fluctuates quite a lot of, of um, a, a variable playing field. And yes? by influx. This is, this is, I propose, that influx works, and I'm going to show how it can be organized, but I'm saying that this is what influx does. You, see, if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't look, you, if you didn't know about it, you wouldn't look for it. No, no material objects, but there's still spirit there. So spirit is everywhere. I mean, it can be wherever that it needs to be for use. Now, I said I wanted to keep Maxwell's equations, so I can't resist showing you what Maxwell's equations are. <laughs> Except in the yellow, say I say this is standard physics, okay? So rest assured, the only thing that's non-standard about it is that this epsilon, this electric permittivity, is now not a constant you put in, but it varies. And furthermore, I'm going to do something tricky because the speed of light along the the second to bottom line depends on the product 
of the electric permit permittivity and the magnetic permeability. So I'm trying to keep special relativity as well as Maxwell's equations. So the speed of light is constant. That's what all special relativity is about. So I'm saying no matter what epsilon varies, mu has to vary in a reciprocal way so that you get the speed of light no matter what these influx does. So I'm, I'm not trying to change the speed of light. Maybe <laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep life simple from the physics point of view and, and see what we can do. Um, um, but and furthermore, you might ask about conservation of energy. Okay. Many many people take conservation of energy extremely seriously, and and as soon as you propose something that doesn't conserve energy, they say, "Oh, useless." We've known we've known from this. One of the basic principles of physics: that conservation of energy is, is is is, and if you violate that, then you're in serious trouble. But and so they propose ideas for influx that satisfy energy conservation or which is the same thing causal closure of the physical so this is that the, n n the no effect um, outside sorry, outside the physical world can influence what happens inside the physical that's what we mean by causal closure that's why we use the idea of a shell around the physical world and this meeting is about breaking that shell so influx can come into the physical world so some people have proposed, there's four different ideas here that people have proposed which c could allow for influx in without, vi without, they say, violating the conservation of energy. Um, they can, you can bias the probabilities in quantum physics. You can, or you can vary the time in which these ultimate actions, the measurements occur. That's Henry Stapp proposed that. Or you, you can move edu energy from one place to another, but that doesn't really satisfy conservation of energy. Or you can use non-local entanglement. But each of these, all of these steps are extremely small because quantum, quantum Planck's constant, quantum effects are extremely small. But I'm going to propose things that are huge by comparison so that I'm going to propose something which I think we should look for first before looking into all these very small um, quantum phase exchanges. And I have to accept that because permittivity is now varies with position and time, it's a function of position R and time C, it varies in space and time, just the fact that that varies in space and time means that energy is not conserved. Because it varies with time, energy is not conserved, and because it varies with position, momentum, total momentum is not conserved. So we just have to bite the bullet and say that in, in some particular parts of cells, or in our brain, wherever influx occurs, then we don't have conservation of energy. It's not the end of the world. It's not, it's not the end of physics either, because I can do lots of physics. I can still use this formula, but the force with these epsilons that vary with position and time, I can still do, repeat all of the standard physics. And I'm going to show you some results later, just using standard Newtonian physics, but with, with these variable permittivities. So... It's, it's a serious proposal, and I hope that one day physicists will measure the permittivity in cells and see whether they can detect these fluctuations. So that's, that's what I'm proposing. That's the first proposal we make, that the, the signature of influx into the nature, one of the important signatures of influx in, of, of spiritual into the, into the physical is the fact that the property, a property of the vacuum has changed the permittivity and the permeability vary in ways that are specific to a particular place and time, but their product is still constant, so the speed of light is still the same. That's what we're proposing. The second part of the proposal is a particular plan for organizing it. Because we want to, you see, some people say micromanagement is a dirty word. I mean, we, we heard it this morning. But we know from the writings that providence, universal providence is useless unless there is particular providence. Do you, does anyone remember that? There has, you have to have providence in particulars as well as providence in general. So I'm going to... But also, each discrete degree, you have, to, you have to give it something to do. There's, if I have 27 discrete degrees, each of those 27 things has to do something individual. Each, you know, each 
level of heaven has, has a particular job. Each part of mental minds has a particular s process to accomplish. Each part of physics has to do something specific. So if, if there's influx, we don't just want um, to just pull these electrons around. We want to allow physics, there's a discrete degree, 3.1 to 3.2, they actually have to do something. So maybe it's, it's meso management, not micro management. So this is a reminder again of the of these steps A to E of of um, what happens when love in acts by means of wisdom to do something. A plan. How our love makes a, gets wisdom to make a plan for achieving a use. And now I'm going to show a way to do steps in physics. And just with dumb particles and fields, okay? Because all the consciousness and all the love and all the desires is in the spiritual degree. Physics is inert, ob you know, they have forces, but they don't think. Physi physical objects don't think. Computers never think. Atoms never think. Molecules. So if we want to use, a molecule wants to do something, we have to put the wants in quotes, because that's a metaphor. So going back to my big any ad, which you may remember. On the, on the left, the orange is love, the heavens. The blue is wisdom and thinking, that's the external mind which you have every day. And on the right is physics, the natural natural world. And so it's, it's the 3.1 degree which we're trying to invent a role for that fits into the overall scheme of correspondences and all that that we get from the, the heavenly doctrine. So we know 3. Point, so 3.1, as I say, where, the, where all the, the use has come. These are all, where, when, the, when the, the spiritual or the mental decide to do something, the first thing they do is convey this end or this, the intended use or the target, whatever you call it, into that 3.1. So all of these arrows, black, these three black arrows, are uh, the ways in which the 3.1 degree receives a plan in mind uh, by goal or target or end in the natural and the physical I, I say how the molecules in the cell should be arranged to achieve a use as an end so what I'm saying is that it, the spiritual or part of a bird that we heard about from Andy if it's going to do something in the physical world it has to have an idea where the physical should be at some future time and and if it does, if, it, if the physical world gets, if the physical body gets there, then it, you've done what you wanted, but it might not. And so, so part A is, is defining an end. So 3.1 degree, whatever it is, it's the finest thing in nature or the formative substance. I think formative substance is a good idea. Um, is the first thing of a formative substance is it's, it's formative substance, if I remember correctly, forms um, the, the physical materials into a desired form. So first of all, it has to know what the desired form is. There has to be a target there. That's what I'm saying here. And then, and then we have to, step B, is we have to e extrapolate from now into the future. So wisdom, if, if, it's in the, if it's planning in the spiritual, has to use its ability to look ahead. You've got to see ahead to whether the target is going to be accomplished. So you have to extrapolate the present configuration of the world up to the time of the, of the, of the target. So, and, but we can do this for a given process time. You can do it, because I mentioned earlier, this process time, which is spiritual time, and there's metric time, which is like spread out um, space and universe. So th this future between now and, the, and when the goal is to be accomplished, is spread out in metric time. So we can imagine fields doing things before you advance in process time. So, so you, you can, I say the cell must know, in quotes, whether it's on track or not. So it has to be able to extrapolate. It has to do it without consciousness, because this is in the natural. So what I do is I propose that the electromagnetic field, or actually all of the fields, including quantum fields, Defined, uh, uh, governed by this variational principle we heard from, uh, from Ron, that, that just tells you how the fields propagate into the future. So you, that immediately tells us if you could look at that part of the fields in the further metric time, you could tell what's going to happen. 
and you can see um, what's happening. So this 3.2 degree, based on the, on the on the charges existing now, before you change anything or the permittivity, it, it tells you what's going to happen in the future. And the reason is that uh, this is just a physics digression here, because these electromagnetic and quantum fields follow a strict wave equation, which comes from the variational principle. And so these are Maxwell's equations again. There's a time there. Oh, time's flying. Anyway, so I better change my goal, haven't I? <laughs> so now we want to determine whether the extrapolated field agree with the target. So we have to have some way the part of this new 3.1 degree has to work out this G function, which is the difference between the extrapolated configuration at the time of the goal versus the target. So th the goal is to minimize G. So I'm trying to formulate this in a, in a mathematical way such that mathematical physics equations can be used to change the permittivity of the vacuum in such a way to minimize the goal function g. So if goal function g was zero, it means that the extrapolated um, configuration at the time of the goal was equal to the target, because then the square would be zero. So once you've got your g function, which defines whether the, the goal is satisfied or not, or it's a measure of how much you're missing the goal, then you have to, you have to work back. Thinking can do that. If you're if your wife asks you to plan something, you, you, you think of the goal and then you work back to see whether it, it, you know, what do we have to adjust in order to achieve a goal. And so there's a, there's a standard way in physics which is often used in engineering to, to do this. It's called a joint solution. These are, are solutions that are backwards in time from the goal back down to the present. But because it's not really time travel because it's still in the future part of metric time. The, these future part of metric time is not yet determined. So we're playing around with the, the, the flexible part of the future. The near future is a flexible time. And so we start with the G, and the joint solutions can propagate the derivatives, the sensitivity of the G function with respect to the variation of the permittivity psi, the rescaling function. This is called a back propagation method. It's used a lot. Um, in computer modeling, and the joint solutions are used a lot in engineering. If you're designing a wing and you want to minimize the, the drag over lift um, ratio of a wing, then you want to adjust all the parameters in order to minimize this function, and then they use these joint solutions all the time in engineering, and also in the backpropagation method. And also in engineering, they they, they adjust the, 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 the flexible parameters, which are in this case the psi function, which adjusts the permittivity. The, there's a, what's called a gradient descent method, which reduces the, the, goal, the, the g function. In other words, re reduces this discrepancy. So you have to repeat these steps until you get to the target. So what I'm doing is proposing a rather complicated mechanism, a backwards and forwards process in the 3. Point, well, in, in, in 3.2, but managed by 3.1, that imitates by correspondences what we think is the process by which love and wisdom in, interact with each other. So I'm, I'm, when I first thought of this, I didn't have this close correspondences between, between the, the spiritual love and wisdom interacting and these goals and fields interacting. But now I've got it lined up so that they correspond rather accurately. And that gives me some confidence, based on, on the importance of correspondences in the Henry Doctrine, that I'm on the right track. And so it's a little bit more complicated than I would have thought of myself. But with, with prompting from the ideas of Swedenborg, it seems to make sense. So now I, I've proposed some equations which can be used to adjust the electric charges of permittivity to achieve particular ends. So I, have, I can write down these equations and solve them on a computer. So that's what I've done. So I'm going to calculate the effects of these formal causes. So by formal causes, I mean influx into the 3.1 and from the 3.1, this, this formative substance into the electric field. And I'm going to use back propagation. I'm going to, use, going to try some toy molecules. Okay. By a toy molecule, here's an example of a toy molecule. 
Oops. So start there. Then I press this. No. There. Here. So there's an example of a toy molecule with in, in a cell. So you can see these red, green and red um, circle of charges up uh, above and below. I'm, I'm imagining a, 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 this 100-unit molecule has been put into a, into a chaperone cage, and, and it has, this is the size in nanometers of a, of a typical chaperone cage. In, in E. coli, that's called grow L, and uh, um, it, it, this is the size. And so, and the time unit is picoseconds. So this is a standard, uh, this, this is called molecular dynamics calculations. This is, this is a standard technique in physical chemistry or physical molecular biology, whatever you call it. Um, but it doesn't have water, it's very simple. But it's, it just runs um, on a computer. And so what I'm, so now I'm going to, I'm, I'm writing down all the things that I said earlier. There's a target, which is some desired position at a later time. I have a goal function, which measures the discrepancy of the target, so I want to get to g equals naught, or at least minimize it. And I, I want to adjust the permittivity. So I, 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 I invent a new variable, psi, because I don't want the, the, the permittivity to change sign. Per permittivity is always, always positive, so I put it inside an exponential. So no matter how much the psi varies, it's, it's always constant. So psi equals zero means that permittivity is the same as the free vacuum. So I just write this in Python over the last year, having fun. So now I give three examples of how influx in this scheme, having defined a target, how it could make a molecule do things that it wouldn't normally do. So this is this is middle management, okay? Um, uh, this is getting the molecule to do the last bit of micromanagement. So on the left here, we have normal time changes. And on the right, we have time changes after I've adjusted the charges. And I want to move it to the left. So you can see that the one on the left is staying constant, but the one on the right is moving over. I'm, I'm moving the center of mass. So it's actually stretched it a bit. Not quite the same shape. So uh, this is the sort of thing, you can move molecules around in a cell by varying the charges so that the charges in the direction you want to go attract more and the ones on the, on the tail end re repel more. So you can, if you adjust the charges, you can make things, molecules do things that they wouldn't do if you didn't adjust anything. And, and on the right here is the... On the right, up here, this is the variation of the charges on the molecule itself, because there's 100 lines there. You can see 0.05 is a rather small change, but here the charges on the, on the, on the charges of the cage, it says uh, 16 of them, or could be, they're quite big. One is, is quite a large change. It's about 100% change. So this is quite a huge change, if possible, in, in this framework. And you can see the G function here is getting small. It starts off large, and it goes small. So this seems to be a successful achievement of the use, if the use is moving the center of mass of a, of a molecule over. And here we can see, as the iterations go forward, it, uh, you, re you work out the, 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 the changes needed to, to um, move it over. So that just moves over because the G function is getting smaller. Okay, now, we are going to have three examples. One of them, the next most simple one, is to rotate a molecule. And, and I try rotating an angle by 10 degrees, 30 degrees, 45. And here's the G functions. You can see 10 degrees, you can make the G function get smaller and smaller quite readily. And 30 degrees, it's more difficult. And 90 degrees, it's, dif it's quite difficult. It just gets stuck at some... So, so this method doesn't solve all problems. It solves some problems. and sort of at the smallest scale or the next to smallest scale. It, so there's a lot of development needed to see whether it can actually um, do a job of, 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 of for, for protein folding. I'll show a simple example of doing something to a protein, but I haven't managed to get it to fold the whole protein. That's quite difficult. So, so this is rotating. So here, here's an example of rotating by 30 degrees. So here's the one 
on the left here. Oh, sorry. It's it's on the back. It's restarting. I think. No, it's restarting the wrong one. Okay. Right. Oh, you're Im mirroring there. So the it's it's the the top one back propagation. You have to go through to about. I'll tell you when to stop. About there. Okay, down a bit. I mean up. A bit more. I'll, I'll take it from here. So. You We'll see if it crashes again. Okay, well, I'm going to go to full slideshow now. Okay, so on the left here is the molecule with no changes to the charges, and on the right, the, ch the, the change is needed to rotate it. You can see I can make it rotate. It stretches it a bit, so it changes the internal shape. Of that. And now... This is going to die again. No. Here, the final demonstration three is this is a molecule inside a cage, and I want to fold. There's a, there's a loop up the top here, and I want to compress that loop, put, fold it in in some way. So this is an ex a simple example of the folding. So if 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 you, so it folds in a very little bit by itself. That's with no changes. But if we allow Ask me to adjust the permittivity. I can then make it fold in a lot more, so it, it goes flat. And so this is an example of, and the, and you can and you can see on the right how the various charges have to change. Zero is no change, and the the, the molecule is now on the bottom. Lots of hundred hundred molecules change a bit. Most of them get smaller, and the, the, the cage changes also vary. So, the, so, in the summary here is that it can be done. This this is something that could be used to solve, or not to solve, but to allow the influence of the spiritual into the natural. So I think I'm I'm going to treat this as the as the simplest paradigm case of influx from the spiritual into the natural. So I'm, well, I've applied it to protein folding, but it, it could be used for making pr enzymes come along at the right time, moving them to the right place. It could be used in the brain, because when we think, obviously, we affect our nerve cells, so this could be the same process. So there's lots of applications, and it's what the important step here is to make a specific prediction about what is actually changed in the physical so that it, you could test it in some way. So I say here, simple targets are easy to reach, especially if the in energy changes. But I have to confess that more complicated reshaping can be done to some extent, but it often fails uh, by getting stuck partway through. We saw for 90 degrees the G function, the discrepancy decreased very little bit and never, never actually got down close to zero. And, and, I'm, I, and one of the things, because Yes, the G function has local minima. There's a funnel, there's a process of funneling here going down to a minimum, which is similar to the energy focus, energy funnel, but it's quite a different situation. So, and I say that convergence is difficult at high temperatures. When things are vibrating a lot because of high temperatures, there's a lot of little local minimum on each oscillation, and that makes life difficult. And so there are things I should try is to maybe have one set of, one target followed by another target, I should put, put water molecules in because they'll absorb some of the energy. I can allow fast fluctuations in this, in this function and do all that. And so there's, there's lots of things I could improve to make it realistic. And, but I, it's a promising, I think, start to, because we, we made a specific proposal that what changes in physics, what does influx do in physics? It changes the relative permittivity of the vacuum. So this is something hasn't been proposed before. Um, and, and then how it changes, I propose that there are target configurations that are specified by influx, and there's a physical feedback mechanism going backwards and forwards in metric time, which can drag objects 
So it's delegated to the physical to do the last little micromanagement of the molecules to get them to do a specific end. So it might seem only a small step, but in fact, it's a proposal for how spiritual impacts could have an effect in nature. And I, I, I think that these effects on permittivity should be measurable. In principle, you could measure them by having a very small clock and putting it where you think the permittivity is varying. So you want a clock that's small enough, a, a little atomic clock that's small enough to fit inside a cell, which I think is a challenge. Okay, it's an experimental challenge, but I'm sure it's amazing what things have been measured. Um, but the point is that in this way, just the fact that affirmativity does vary locally like this is an example of how the influx gives final causes. Final cause means the, the end in view or the use has an effect on what happens now. That's what a final cause means. Ar this comes from Aristotle. And so in this way, final causes could be active in nature. And we, we have a way of doing this without time travel, um, without altering the historical past, because we only change the future that's not yet determined. There's a middle, there's, there's space-time is spread out, there's the past here, sorry, the past here, then you come up to the present, and then the, the future is not definite. So we're just changing, playing around in the future undefined region before it gets to be definite. And so we're not violating stupid laws like time travel. And, and no longer is the physical universe causally closed, and a greater range of explanations would be useful because in biology there's so many things that happen seemingly miraculously um, with proteins and enzymes come along at the right time and all sorts of issues of timing, how, how cells recover from damage because it seems to have a target which is the cell in the correct formation. Um, and so there's lots of issues which might have be offer new explanations for um, if something like this was possible.